So now I'm very happy to announce the third keynote uh, of our conference uh, this year. Uh, this is the keynote by Dr. Thomas Beck, who is a reader in the British context that's uh, like an associate professor in the uh, world outside the UK. So a reader in psychology at the School of, of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences of the University of Edinburgh. He was born, born in Poland and studied medicine in Germany and Switzerland, speaks excellent German, if I may say so, uh, obtaining his doctorate with a thesis on acute aphasias, uh, which means language disorders caused by brain diseases at the University of Freiburg in Germany. He worked in Berlin, Bern, Cambridge, and Edinburgh from 2010 and 2000, 2018. He was president of the World Federation of Neurology Research Group on Aphasia, Dementia, and Cognitive Disorder. In the course of time, he, his research focus shifted more and more to the impact of language learning and multilingualism on cognitive functions across the lifespan. Thomas Beck is a highly popular speaker and has given more than 100 keynotes and plenaries worldwide. He is a living example of linguistic borderlessness, if I may say so, as he commands seven languages at academic level, thus his presence as our keynote speaker at our conference is a must. His keynote will give us an answer to the question of why our brains need languages to cross borders. So Thomas Buck, uh, Dr. Buck, the screen is yours. Thank you very much in advance. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Indeed, reader is a medieval title coming from the time where books were so expensive that of course students couldn't be given mm. them. So the reader was the person who was reading, so to say, yeah. to the audience. So it goes back, I think, to certain century or so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, uh, but basically, as you mentioned, uh, my background is cognitive neurology. So you can ask immediately your question, you know, what is this guy doing at a conference on language? learning and teaching. And I try, I will try to redeem myself by explaining. So the structure of my talk is, I want to start saying, yeah, the German speakers will recognize the title on the Weg zur Sprache, a famous book by Heidegger, which in fact, I was reading in Freiburg. I will come to that time in a moment. So kind of my seven personal encounters with language. Then I want to take a historical perspective, starting as one should with the beginning of the world, and then move to current data in cognitive science of language learning and multilingualism, and end up with kind of bilingualism debates at the end in some way, I would say maybe then linking my talk to the previous one about the politics and ideology and how it interacts with, with data and with science. So starting with my personal way, I want to speak a little bit about my own personal background, then my PhD, which brought me very much into the area of language, my work in language in schizophrenia, in neurodegeneration and so on, in Bern, Switzerland and Cambridge, and then the shift of focus to bilingualism in Edinburgh and other places in the world. Uh, my attempt at multilingual education of my daughter, which in a way made me also aware of the developmental aspects, which were never a topic of my work, but became very intense topic of my personal interest. And in fact, something over the last year or so lockdown, my journey of discovery into the interesting, I would say fascinating land of sociolinguistics. So starting about my background, so here are the places where, so to say, my family comes from. So on the left side is Zabrze or Hindenburg in German in Silesia, where my mother grew up as a German speaker. And on the right is Lvov or Lviv in Ukraine now, which where my father grew up as a Polish speaker. Now, uh, only recently, when I started learning more about sociolinguistic, I realized that in fact, I had quite a good introduction into the question of language and ideology, just growing up and observing very different attitude to languages and particularly to German in Krakow and in Silesia, which were only 100 kilometers apart, not that far away. But in Silesia, language was really, there, was, there were kind of language wars going back to Kulturkampf to Bismarck 19th century, where in the German 
German time, Polish was perceived as uh, something negative, forbidden, and so on. Uh, in fact, my mother told me when she was a schoolgirl, the slogan at the entrance of the school was the Polish Polish is unser Feind, whoever speaks Polish is our enemy. And then after 45, when the area became Polish, uh, I remember my aunt telling how she, her mother was warned by a secret policeman on the street when she was speaking German to her daughter that, you know, next time you will have you will be real, really in trouble. So from this point of view, there was quite a lot, I would say, of language wars. In contrast, in Krakow, where I grew up, and in Galicia, in, in Lvov, uh, German was simply the lingua franca of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So my grandfather would have studied in Vienna, or studied in Vienna, and that would have been the language with which, let's say, a Pole, a Hungarian, a Romanian, and a German would speak because that was the common language. So it was a relatively positive attitude to German as a lingua franca of Central and Eastern Europe. So, as I say, I, did, I grew up with it without even knowing it. So that's kind of learning through appreciation now. And then another thing, which again, I didn't probably recognize the importance at that time was, I mean, here on the left, left lower corner, you can see, uh, you can see uh, the school which I attended. And one of the pupils in the school was a certain Joseph Conrad or Józef Konrad Korzeniowski, for whom English was the fifth or sixth language that he learned. And he ended up as a rather well-recognized author in, uh, of English literature. So from this point of view, I would say a good example that you can reach certain, I would say, relatively good standards, even in your not just second or third, but in your fourth, fifth, or sixth language. Then I moved to Germany when I was 17, and I'm particularly delighted. That's why I was kind of hoping to come to Saarbrücken, uh, you know, when before, of course, the lockdown happened, because in fact, I started my academic life in the University of Saarland, University of Saarbrücken, namely in Homburg, Saar. So the medical faculty is a few thousand kilometers to the, uh, to the east is Homburg Saar. Here you can see it, a lovely small place with the Schlossberg, with the um, uh, mountain on the top. And that's where I kind of made my first steps. I was then for a year in Bochum and Essen in Ruhrgebiet. And then I did my degree in Hamburg. Uh, here you can see it, another beautiful place in the north, which in a way made me, of course, very aware of different German dialects, particularly as I then moved to Freiburg in Breisgau to do my PhD. And that was on recovery of aphasia, the question selective deficits versus compensation. And the theoretical background there was the emergence of cognitive neuropsychology and ideas of modularism. So under the influence of generative linguistics, the kind of predominant idea was that they are kind of different modules in the brain, maybe here's the syntax module and so on. And what happens in aphasia was that uh, in a way the kind of the syntax module or whatever language module is being knocked out by the disease. That was the predominant view, and you can see here uh, in the corner, so to say, kind of box and arrows models, which were very, very popular at the time. But around this time, so in 1980s, the new challenges came up. So firstly, the idea of functional regeneration of the brain, reorganization that in fact, uh, what we see in recovery from aphasia, from language disorders, was not something as modular as we kind of expected. In fact, uh, you have people acquire new skills, people recover, then they fall back, then they recover again. It was not really quite as neat as these models would predict. And then, of course, we got new technologies. I would say the in incredible importance, which we see now because we can have this meeting across continents with uh, internet, new technologies make people think differently, moving, so to say, from what I would say beginning of a journey from modules to dynamic systems of networks. And that will become relevant in a few slides where I'll be speaking about different models of bilingualism. So again, at that time, I was not realizing that one day, this kind of debates, which I experienced as a PhD student in the context of aphasia, of language disorders, in stroke patients, in uh, other neurodegenerative patients, uh, that this will become also very, very important in the context of bilingualism. Then I worked uh, clinically in psychiatry in Bern, and even then I came across interesting language questions because my very first patient came from Somalia, spoke Somali and Amharic, but very little uh, English or German, and the question was whether 
what he produced in his language or a kind of neolo neologism or not. So in a way, I realized that wherever we work in Europe, we need to be prepared also to be with patients who might not speak the main language of the country, which is very much the case, for instance, in Britain as well. So that kind of links maybe to what you have about children coming with very, very different linguistic heritage. The same is definitely true for language. I revisited the question of language and schizophrenia in a paper published in 2012. And in fact, in a very recent study with a student of mine has done in Uganda about multilingualism in psychotherapy. So this topic, again, came quite early in my career, but remained with me for the rest of my professional life. And then I spent very important uh, formative years in Cambridge, working with uh, John Hodges, a neurologist, but also neuropsychologists, psychologists, psycholinguists like William Marcel Wilson uh, and um, uh, like uh, Friedman Pulvermüller, whose pictures I have here. And here the question was, we were working not so much on stroke as my PhD, but on neurodegeneration, diseases like Alzheimer's, like Pick's disease, like motor neuron disease and so on. And I was working on the relationship between dementia and aphasia, but also the relationship between movement and cognition. So what we found for instance, was that patients who have movement disorder were also worse in uh, their perception and production of verbs, of words which are related to movement as, so to say, conceptual units. So that linked into the idea of embodied cognition. And then I moved, well, over 10 years ago to Edinburgh, where I'm now based in the school, which is a school of philosophy, psychology, and language sciences, which suits me quite well, as you can imagine, but with a lot of contacts I have to neuroscience and even to informatics, with a lot of uh, international contacts with the World Federation of Neurology, which, as I say, I was leading the group on aphasia, dementia, and cognitive disorders for eight years, did a lot of work in India. I will show some of it uh, to you later on. And then personal interest in language development through my daughter, who, well, I mean, is kind of, by, I was hoping to for her be quadrilingual. She is kind of two languages, so not quite what I hope, but I mean, I would say better than nothing. And throughout my career, because I was so interested in language, I was trying to keep myself informed about development in linguistics. So uh, one of my friends and um, uh, Martin Haspelmatt, whom you can see here, uh, described me once in German, it's kind of a wonderful expression I found, linguist of the Zweiten Bildungsweg. So to those who don't know German educational system, Zweiten Bildungsweg is basically for people who kind of didn't do quite well at school, didn't do the A-levels, but then at some point think, well, maybe uh, after working for years and years, I should go back to school do my A-levels, go to university, and that is Zweite Bildungsweg. So in some way, I would describe myself as a linguist of Zweite Bildungsweg. I didn't study as my main subject, but I was trying to keep up through personal encounters, through reading books, going to meetings and conferences, attending summer schools, such as Linguistic Society of America and Linguistic Typology. And over last year, I because of course it was impossible to travel in person. I thought I can travel in mind by going into different areas. And one of them was sociolinguistic. I spent quite a lot of time reading different books of sociolinguistic and so on. And if you are interested in this topic, here is a link to a talk that I gave in the series of Abralin. Many of you might know it, uh, the Association Brasileira da Linguistica. And they, so they are kind of uh, topics where I speak basically about aphasia and, and sociolinguistics. So that was kind of a quick introduction how I got into language, so my Unterwegs to language story. Now, uh, let me just give a quick overview of what I think are kind of, at least from my uh, point of view, important things about the kind of history of, of uh, language multilingualism and so on. And as I promised, I want to start in the beginning, so with the beginning of the world. And of course, all of us in Europe grew up with the idea of the you know, Genesis uh, 11, 1 to 9, and the whole earth was one language and one speech. So I would say even in our creation myth, we have the idea of a kind of general monolingualism and then languages diverging. 
Interestingly, this is not necessarily universally uh, true because if you go, for instance, to Australia, in Northern Australia, there is a mess practically shared by a lot of people from different tribes speaking different languages of their ancestral goddess, Warramurungunji, traveling from Indonesia, then coming on shore and then setting up different tribes, different nations, all of them characterized by their distinct land, food, and language. I like the connection of food and language, but apart from that, uh, the idea is that the world was meant from the beginning to be multilingual. And if we look back into societies which still exist in the world, which are hunter-gatherers or agricultural societies, we notice that multilingualism is the rule rather than exception. In many places in the world, we have a phenomenon called linguistic exogamy, which means that it is considered incestuous to marry someone who speaks the same language. Because if you have small linguistic groups of 500 or 1,000 people, then very likely someone speaking the same language will be genetically uh, related. So if you marry someone from outside your language, it is the best, so to say, uh, guarantee of having of avoiding uh, genetic endogamy. Uh, I'm not sure if you realize that the linguistic exogamy is officially supported by European Union. Uh, there is a special program uh, to support it. It is called Erasmus. One of the, let's say, uh, probably not originally targeted effect of Erasmus was that apparently students who go on exchange are three times more likely to marry someone coming from a different country and speaking a different language than those who don't. So we, I would say linguistic is where alive and well. But why is it important from uh, my point of view? Because it means that, so to say, the circumstances in which the human language developed and which you can find still in those societies or kind of closest maybe to them is that you need to learn languages all the time across your lifetime. I mean, you grow up with more than one language because your mother and father will speak different languages, your grandfathers anyway. And then when you marry, you are supposed to learn another language. So from this point of view, the idea is that you learn new languages across the lifetime. It's not just about children. And some societies enforce strict control of language output. So in some, you are allowed to mix languages. In others, it's very, very problematic. And that is something to which I will come at the very end of my talk when I mention the, uh, I think, fascinating but controversial topic of translanguaging. And the third thing is that in this case, from at least my point of view, uh, looking at the evolutionary perspective, multilingualism can be seen as a natural form of mental exercise. This is what everybody does. And here just the pictures, I mean, the, the picture on the right upper corner is from a talk which I gave in uh, Africa, this uh, meeting of Society of uh, African New Science in Entebbe in Uganda a few years ago. And I remember my first question, because when I speak, you know, in Britain, the question is always, well, do you want to tell us that it's possible to learn another language? It must be awful and waste of time. And here, the first question was, uh, sir, I'm from Ghana, and in Ghana we all speak three to four languages. Is it better if I speak five or six or seven? So that is, so to say, so in many places in Africa, basically the baseline is three to four languages. And then if you are good at languages, then you go up from five upwards. And here the picture on the right is uh, of my friend and colleague, Nick Evans, uh, in Australia. Well, he's from Australia, but this is in Papua New Guinea. I mean, who is working a lot with these multilingual communities in Aboriginal Australia and in Papua New Guinea. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I've forgotten to. Okay, then, sorry. I think, okay. Okay, so uh, now, one moment, yes. Uh, so here the question arises that particularly under influence of Chomsky linguistic, the idea of competence and so on, there is a perception that there is a kind of very deep divide between language learning as children, where you reach the kind of perfect competence and having throughout the day, and language learning, language acquisition, which is later laborious and so on and so on. So the idea is on one hand, you have the early simultaneous bilingualism, natural effortless balance, reaching native-like, uh, ability versus second foreign language learning, which is formal, effortful, and imperfect. 
And the question for me is, is it a neat dichotomy which reflects real life language acquisition and use? And as I say, from the point of view of kind of our evolutionary history, I would say that we are programmed to learn languages at all times in our life. And in fact, I will come to it uh, a bit later. One of my main interest is the language learning in later life. And I think it's probably an ideal activity for people after retirement. So language learning is not just from at least my point of view, not just a preserve of the young, youngest. And that is the case already in hunter gatherer societies. So we are not speaking about something very new, which came suddenly in you know, the 21st language, uh, 21st century. Now, another thing I find interesting here, again, the school I told you about, to which I attended in Krakow, Novodvorek, uh, the question of language learning as part of education. I mean, obviously, this was crucial through most of European history. So, you know, still when this school was, I mean, I mean the school was founded in 1580s, uh, but it was, I mean, the building was built in 19th century, and we have here, of course, a copy of Raphael's School of Athens. So in a way, educated people would learn Latin and Greek, sometimes maybe even Hebrew. And what I find interesting is, I am a big fan of European one plus two idea that, you know, it's not just about one language. In many cultures, you have the idea that, in fact, different languages are particularly good for different things. So Latin would be the language of law, a language of the church, and so on. Greek would be a language of philosophy, maybe more of poetry, and so on. So we find it across cultures. Alfonso El Sabio, beautiful example, the uh, Alfonso the Wise, the king of Spain, who was writing his uh, legal texts in Spanish, but the lyric in Portuguese. And in 19th century, I would say, in the time where first neurology came up, aphasiology and the classical authors of the late 19th century, it was clear that people would read in French, German, and English. And basically, I mean, they might not have been able to write and speak, but they were definitely able to at least have the passive knowledge of the three kind of what was considered three main European languages. But this is not only the case in European civilization. So if you look at the uh, Islamic world, there is also an interesting kind of coexistence of two extra languages, which, for instance, were from Turkey to uh, India would have been spoken. Arabic as a language of religion and law, but then Persian as a religion or as a language of poetry, of art, and so on. And you find similar things in India with Sanskrit and Pali. And in fact, Bengal until early 20th century, educated Bengalis would speak English because it was important for business and administration, but then Persian because that would be considered the language of culture. So from this point of view, I think we can go across different cultures in the world and knowledge of more than two languages has been considered something very, very basic. And now let us move to a very different world. These are headlines from English newspapers from the last year. Doctors give pupils sick notes to duck French and German lessons and in fears the stress of learning a second language is harming their mental health. So here, suddenly, in the country I happen to live in, language learning is perceived as a danger to mental health. It's so unhealthy, it's so dangerous. I mean, how could you ever do it to your children? And here you have another headline about, you know, GPs being worried. Uh, that uh, uh, it is so stressful that they are being signed off by a GP from language learning. So how did we get from here? A moment. So how did we get from here to here? Well, I think one of the problems in the way how language learning is being, so to say, promoted is, that is very much the idea is it's instrumental. It's good for business. It will make you, you know, uh, getting a better job and being better paid and so on. Now, this attitude, of course, is very prone to produce a kind of English is enough attitude because at the end of the day, you can probably do all your business in English and in most places and you can get away with that. So why should you ever learn another language? So that means if you speak English, you don't need any languages at all. If you speak anything but English, English is one language and that's it. You don't need anything extra. If unavoidable, maybe, you could say, well, for business, maybe Chinese will be quite useful. I would add here also for culinary pleasures, being a fan of Chinese cuisine. 
and for leisure, maybe Spanish with all this kind of beautiful romantic ideas of, you know, salsa and Despacito as the big, big hit, you know, I think the first non-English language hit or not in the hit parades and so on. And this attitude, of course, is associated with a low status of small and minority languages and immigrant languages. So in a way, the idea is you have English, which is absolutely the top of the hierarchy. Then you have maybe, as I say, Chinese for business and for work and Spanish for pleasure. And then everything else comes below and has practically very limited value. I think we need to get away from this way of trying to, so to say, to advertise and promote language learning, maybe at fontes back to the roots. So away from language seen as memory for words, the idea of native speakers so that you sound like a local, that's why maybe Latin, Greek, and Hebrew were not so bad after all, because there were no native speakers, and towards a vision which focuses on languages, mental exercise for the brain, that is something which my work is particularly concerned with, but also as transferable skills and as a shared experience. Now, where I would say from my point of view, neuroscience comes into it is the question how we envisage, how we imagine the brain. And here I will come back in a moment to what I started telling you about my Freiburg time and the shift from modulism to networks. After one of the papers, which I will be uh, describing later on, was, of mine was published about positive effects of language learning, I got this answer from a reader of a popular English newspaper. Of course, it's nice to have a second language, but I don't believe this science twaddle for one second. The human brain can only contain a finite amount of information. And as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. That space is much better utilized for science, history, and our rich culture. Uh, the newspaper was Daily Mail, which is very widely read in UK. And what you can see here is what I call the kind of the limited capacity, the limited resources model. The idea that the brain is a little bit like a chest of drawers. You have things there, and if you put something else, then it takes space for something else. So there is a kind of, con con I mean, there is a limited space and a constant competition for space. And of course, learning to language, I mean, if you learn another language, it takes away valuable space you use for mathematics, for history, for science, and so on and so on. However, this is something which you can find also in some, you know, quite influential politicians. So for instance, a sentence, we have only two gigabytes of memory in our brain, was said by Lee Kuan Yew, former prime minister of Singapore, who interestingly wanted people to be bilingual in English and Chinese, but was fighting against the use of other variants of Chinese, of Cantonese, uh, Hakka, Hokkien, and so on, which were spoken in Singapore. So the idea, I don't have no clue where these two gigabytes come from, uh, but the idea of this kind of limited space is intuitively very convincing. You know, here we have the brain, here we have the space, and then, you know, if you push here too many languages, then something must be falling, falling out the other side of the brain. Now, like, with many prejudices, there is something true about it, but the main thing is quite different. So I will now, within the next minute, hopefully, slow down your lexical answers. So the picture, so by the way, this is my daughter posing with the kind of a nice model of, you know, limited space and, you know, where you put things in. So what you see here is, of course, a dog. And in Polish, dog is called pies. In English, of course, dog. In Spanish, it would be perro. In French, chien. In Catalan, interestingly, gos. Okay, so Polish is pies. Okay, so now I hope you have you know, learned. You probably all know dog and perro and chien. You might have learned now a bit of Catalan and Polish, pies and gos. So now I will show you a word and three pictures. And you have to tell me which of the three pictures corresponds best with the word above. Start. Okay. So, depending on your language repertoire, you might go for pies 
on the right side, or for Spanish PS as feet below, or for actually rent Polish red PS for dog. So it means if you know more than one language, people are usually slightly slower on lexical decision tasks because they screen whatever comes in against a much larger entries, both in terms of sounds and written form and so on and so on. So it's not surprising, it's a very well established phenomenon that with learning languages, we get slower even in our own language by maybe 550 milliseconds or so, or 100 milliseconds. So there is an effect, but I would say this effect is well to be taken into account because of the positive aspects of it. So here I have, so to say, so that would be the kind of the limited limited uh, amount or limited model. You have this word, and if you have it in too many languages, it slows you down. But then, of course, on the other hand, you start making bridges. Now, uh, Thomas has kindly said you know, how, for instance, uh, uh, languages belonging to the Romance group can kind of cross react, cross understand each other. I would go further. Now, I don't know how many of you speak Finnish, but if you go to Turku, the second city in, uh, in Finland, you find a place called Kaupatori, and you would say that sounds very strange and has probably nothing to do with anything else, Kaupatori. But in fact, Kaupa is the same thing that we'll have in shipping, in Kubenhauen, in Kaufmann, Kaufbeuren, and so on, in German, also Polish word Kupiec. So in a way, this word moved through all Europe across. And Tori is related to uh, Polish, Russian, and so on, Tark, Tork. Uh, in fact, up to Romania, you fight Tergumures. So in a way, we can now suddenly, we can just take these two Finnish words, and if we don't see that you know, something different is simply ununderstandable, we have suddenly a kind of mental map of population, economic, and linguistic history of much of Central and Northern and, and, and Eastern Europe. So that's, I would say, how networks work. So <clears throat> in limited resources models, you have the chest of drawers analogy, everything is st static, localization the competition for space. In added value models, in contrast, you have interaction and it is more than some of the ingredients because the new connections are themselves, so to say, valuable. You have a dynamic localization, neuroplasticity and emphasis on learning and adaptation. So generally, I would say that uh, we have seen in neuroscience an incredible movement, which basically from the time where I was doing my PhD in Freiburg in the 80s, where things were kind of modular and multilingual was difficult to put in because do you have different models for each language or do you have a language model with sub-models for every... Now in network models, multilingual is absolutely normal. So basically monolingual network is simply a network which is lacking richness. So it's a kind of reduced form, but generally, languages can be attached to this, so to say, uh, network models. Now, the, the second prejudice, I mean, one is kind of waste of money, we have only time and so on. I would say some people would go further and say, well, it's even dangerous to have other languages because it can cause confusion. And again, it is a fact we know from science, so you have always a kind of, many prejudices have a small, small, uh, so to say, uh, uh, well, nucleus of true, but are then misunderstood. So it is true that there are studies suggesting that if we, all languages of a multilingual are parallel activating the brain. So although I speak now English, my German, my Polish, my Spanish, and so on will be activated as well. And as I showed you, multilinguals have slower lexical access, but this increased challenge is like a good exercise for cognitive control and monitoring. So basically, because you as a multilingual, you have to do, to cope with different languages, it's like an exercise, it's like going on foot or by a cycle to work instead of taking a car. You know, you might get a little bit slower there, but it will be good for your health and that's the same for our mental health. Now, so again, this kind of the myth or the idea of confusion is quite old, goes back, I mean, at least I could find it very clearly uh, expressed in 1923 in a work on English-Welsh bilinguals, where the author, Sarah, was saying that the bilinguals have lack of definiteness in meaning, 
and he claimed fusion is carried over from the brain area connected with language to those connected with other functions. So in fact, bilingual is not only bad for language, it messes up completely your brain. Now, there is no brain science in this at all. These are all assumptions about the brain. I mean, he was a teacher, he never worked in with any patient, let alone neuroimaging, which of course would not have existed there and pathology and so on. So in a way you have this kind of prejudice coming from the chest of drawers model of the brain being taken as so self-evident that it doesn't even need any, uh, any connection. However, of course, this was in the context of English being perceived as a superior language versus the kind of barbarian Gallic, Irish, or or Welsh, which you know have to be eradicated, which is still a linguistic ideology in many parts of UK now. Now it's not by chance that the kind of big move towards recognition of bilingualism happened in the context of La Révolution Tranquille, the Quiet Revolution in Quebec, where the idea was we want to be maître chez nous, masters in our own house. And here, researchers study, started studying systematically bilinguals, bilingual and monolingual children and found, not surprisingly from us, our perspective now, but surprisingly for them, that in fact, if anything, bilinguals outperform monolinguals once you, con once you correct for socioeconomic status. So the problem with Welsh studies was, of course, that they were children, middle-class children, English-speaking monolinguals from cities being compared with the rural, uh, practically much more from, I mean, Welsh speaking kids from deprived areas. Once you control for it, the effect becomes the opposite, the bilinguals outperform monolinguals. And this, uh, so to say, direction of study was continued from Montreal, moved to Toronto. I will come to Toronto in a moment because I will be speaking about the metalinguistic skills, social cognition, executive functions as the three areas which have been demonstrated to be positively influenced by language learning and multilingualism. So starting with meta, the kind of metalinguistic knowledge is probably the easiest thing to understand. Having different languages means that you have different ways of mapping the world, different ways of interpreting, different correspondences between languages, and you realize the arbitrariness of the writing system of different languages. And the kind of beautiful citation, which the German speakers here will appreciate, is Wer fremde Sprachen nicht kennt, weiß nichts von seiner eigenen. Whoever doesn't speak foreign languages doesn't know his own. However, this idea has been, I would say, wonderfully expressed by the Russian uh, psychologist, cognitive psychologist, Lev Semyonovich Vygotsky. In his main book, he writes, and here I want to give a flavor of another language, which kind of is not often cited, unfortunately, uh, but Russian. I mean, Vygotsky has a beautiful style. And what he writes is that learning another language and what he says, I mean, first, the kind of learning is interesting because usfajenie uh, means basically to make something foreign yourself. It comes from sfoje, from your own. So basically the kind of the, establishing the ownership of this foreign language by a child. And then the word is So it liberates the thinking. Now this is translated here from the grasp, but plien in fact means captivity. So in a way, I think you have a wonderful picture here by Vygotsky that far away from being a burden that you have to carry that makes you think slower and so on, learning other languages liberates the mind from the captivity of the concreteness of your specific first language. So this idea has been very, very clearly, beautifully formulated in psychology only already in 1934 in this uh, work by Vygotsky. And there are a lot of studies, not surprisingly, showing how, so to say, bilinguals and bilingual children already immediately reflect about the language and start looking cor at correspondences and so on and so on. Now, the second area, which is quite important, is social cognition. So here I have some pictures of my daughter with her monolingual Spanish-speaking grandma, I mean, grandmother, then with a friend with whom she shares three languages, Polish, English, and German, and with her boyfriend, who is also trilingual, but his languages are 
English, French, and Dutch, so they would be speaking English. So children learn very, very quickly that different linguistic repertories means that you need to speak different mixture of languages with different people. And from there, there is only one single step to perspective taking. So there are studies showing that kids who speak more than one language are much faster in recognizing, for instance, that what I see is not what you see. So, uh, so here, and by the way, there's a kind of beautiful thing when I took my daughter once to a Swahili lesson, which I was, you know, where we had people, you know, from 25 to 75 learning it, her comment was, oh, that's interesting. So I see grown-ups are learning things too, which I think was certainly a message I was very happy to convey to her. And then the third very important function are so-called executive functions. So here, the idea is that the simultaneous activation of different languages, code switching, mixing, a systematic behavior needs to better development of attention control mechanisms. And that means executive control, executive function, that means that you can concentrate also on non-linguistic texts. As I say, you have the price of slower linguistic access, but you get, so to say, a lot of advantage in these three areas, metalinguistic knowledge, social cognition, and executive function. And just to show a couple of my own work in this field, so for instance, we're looking at people learning, uh, I mean, in this case, Spanish and Italian, first year students versus fourth year students, and there was no difference on test of everyday attention, so a test of attentional switching in first year, as you can see, but there was a significant difference after four years. So that means that language learning led to a better development in uh, attentional switching, a completely nonverbal task. Then we are looking whether you can find similar effects even after one week of an intensive course. And we found that indeed uh, learning Gaelic in Salmar Ostag on the Isle of Skye, Scottish Gaelic, we found improvement in switching after one week in all age groups. And we had people up to 80 who participated in our study. And interestingly, because you can say, well, that will disappear, yes. It was lasting only in those who were practicing after the course for at least five hours a week. So from this point of view, we can show a relatively fast improvement in attentional skills coming from intensive language learning. And it's again against this idea that you know everything important language happens in the first few years. It does matter also whether you use those languages or not. So that was another study with Gaelic speakers, where we found that people who practically learned both languages, but then became secondary monolingual, only use English, never Gaelic, are kind of halfway, as you can see, between the English speakers and the uh, active bilingual Gaelic speakers. Now, a study which certainly electrified the field was a study by, uh, by Biawistock from Toronto. So I'm coming back now to the kind of the Canadian Montreal Toronto uh, route, uh, showing that out of their group of 230 patients uh, with dementia, 50% laugh bilinguals, the bilinguals developed dementia four years later. So in 2007, language learning became a question of mental health. And other studies went into the same direction. Very interesting study by Kave et al. from Israel, 2008, who found that people who were speaking daily a language which is not their first language, performed much better cognitively. So here you have not only an effect of language number, but also the kind of the effort of speaking language which is not your first is in fact a positive effect. And these results are interpreted in the light of cognitive reserve. So that means that speaking different language for a longer time builds up these attentional abilities, cognitive reserve, which can then compensate against upcoming pathology. So you will still, uh, you know, you might still develop the pathology of Alzheimer, but later on. And we found, by the way, because one of the criticism against the uh, Toronto study was that most of the bilinguals were immigrants, so maybe the so-called healthy immigrant effect, they were the strongest of their population and so on. However, we found very similar results in Hyderabad in a much bigger group, 648 patients, in which basically the bilinguals were there for the last 500 years. I mean, there is no association of immigration. Hyderabad has been a relatively multilingual place for many, many centuries. And we went further by looking at stroke. So it's not only that you develop dementia four to five years later, if you speak more than one language, you recover faster from stroke. 
So the important thing is there is no difference in the age of stroke. So it's not that bilingualism makes you generally healthy and you will not get a stroke. Unfortunately, no, that has probably more to do with diet, with sport, with genetics and so on. However, if you have the bad luck of getting stroke, you are much more likely to develop normal cognition, to recover. Again, that is in line with the cognitive reserve. And if you develop aphasia, language disorder, it will be probably milder. So it was global aphasia was much more common in monolinguals, so the most severe form of aphasia. So from this point of view, there is, uh, there is evidence both from stroke and from neurodegeneration from dementia suggesting this. Uh, then the question arises, well, is it about language learning? Do you have to learn languages very early? Not necessarily. So here we did a study in Edinburgh where we, Half, I mean, all Scottish kids were tested for their intelligence in 1947 when they were 11, born 36. So we could look whether people who learn another language after age of 11 were performing better than you would expect on the basis of their previous performance. Because otherwise, you could say, well, maybe simply the bright people are more likely to learn languages, so there is no, there is a correlation, but it's the other way around. Uh, it's that uh, being more cognitively better makes you likely to learn a language and not the other way around. But we could show in this study that learning a language after age 11 makes you perform better on cognitive tests that would be predicted from your performance age 11 uh, before you started learning this language. And we did some work on now on uh, language and dementia together with a group Lingo Flamingo founded in Glasgow. And here came another aspect, which I have to admit to my shame, I was not thinking before, and that is the importance of language learning in counteracting loneliness and low self-esteem. I mean, people love these language courses and that was a way also for them to make groups, I mean, uh, to be in touch with each other. In most of our courses, people, build up a WhatsApp group and then stayed in contact long after the end of the course. So in a way, that's another dimension, which I have to admit I was not thinking about before. Now, there is quite a lot of evidence that I was showing you, but not all studies point in the same direction as you would not expect. You have mainly positive results from countries like Canada, India, and Belgium. You have negative results, interestingly, mainly from US. So you can start asking yourself why. And you have quite mixed results from Spain and UK. So in some way, I would say, interestingly, the results of bilingualism studies reflect a little bit the politics in those countries. And there have been a lot of kind of debates. Is it that, so to say, you know, some Americans believe that all US studies are superior to everything else on Earth. Uh, but is it that they may be the kind of the environment and sociolinguistics could play a role as well. And here we have, I mean, I just want to mention very briefly, I am pretty sure it will come up in the discussion, panel discussion later on, that uh, in a country like UK, and I don't want, I mean, US would be you know, another example, uh, David Blanket, the Labour Home Secretary in 2002 was saying that basically people should not speak Indian languages at home, just only English, because it overcomes the schizophrenia, which would be devil's generation generation. So basically speaking an Indian language, speaking at home Punjabi or Bengali or Hindi makes you schizophrenic. And of course makes you more likely to be a terrorist because that was written in the context of the terrorist attacks. On the other hand, there is also a kind of political use of bilingualism data. So I remember when I was kind of looking for results, you know, uh, of reports of uh, my study on stroke, which I just presented to you, uh, there was a kind of nice, uh, you know, uh, Frisian, and this is a Frisian flag, so basically the bilingual Frisians must be recovering better from stroke. Well, there, it is true that bilingualism has these positive effects, but it's not a panacea. It's not, unfortunately, like the fount of use. You, you are old and ill, and then you learn another language, and suddenly you are 20 again. And there is another claim that was made about bilingualism, where, which I think is very interesting, but not strong in terms of uh, empirical evidence so far, and that is that bilinguals are better lovers. If anybody of you wants to do a study on that, please let me know. I would be very interested to hear the results. Uh, 
So I'm coming to the end to leave some time for discussion, hopefully. So there are still many open questions in this field. One is, of course, the number of languages. So basically, is it really better to learn more and more languages, or is it something like a logarithmic curve getting flatter and linguistic distance? I always say to people, well, to be on the safe side, if you want to learn languages, I told you one is never, never enough. You learn two, one very similar to your first language and one very different. Then you are on the safe side. Then you have the question of learning method, implicit like immersion versus explicit like formal teaching. And then of course, many questions which came up now over the last year and a half with the development of online teaching in class versus online. And even if you have online, you can still have tutor-led, person-led teaching online versus different language apps. There are practically no studies that I know about cognitive effects of these different methods. Then of course, different teaching styles speaking and writing, another thing I'm very, very interested in. And then one area of my particular interest, younger versus older learners, because as I told you, I'm particularly interested in people uh, learning, learning another language in the later life, ideally in retirement. And then I just want to mention it because I think it is a kind of big issue and I'm pretty sure it will come up somewhere in, in our panel discussion, language switching and translanguaging. I think we went almost from one extreme to the other, from this kind of puristic idea of different languages to the idea that, you know, it's only one language and mixture. I think this having a different repertoires of languages is really important for us and, and for executive functions important that I'm not just speaking whatever comes to my mind, but I'm speaking whatever is appropriate with the people I'm speaking in, with and the context. And, and as I say, and that is something that children get very, very easily. Uh, here is, by the way, a, um, a I mean, a questionnaire, but I mean, I think we will come now in this last slide. So that is the last slide. Uh, so, Let's keep in touch, hopefully. So first, you can help our research. So here are two links to two surveys online, which we are doing, and I would be grateful. So one is about language learning and teaching experience. So if you learn, learn, I mean, language teacher, you can do both with your hat of language learner and your hat of language teacher. And I, here I'm particularly interested in experience, for instance, of learners from different uh, age groups and so on and so on. And for people who are over 50 or who know anybody over 50 who might be multilingual, we have another questionnaire here about language change in later life. If you are interested in my work, I'm very active on Twitter. So follow me on Twitter is always a good way. And I, I'm uh, sending links to papers and so on. Here is one uh, website, which I am running together with a colleague from uh, UCL Institute of Education, Nina Mehmet-Begovic, Health Linguistic Diet. This is my profile page from the University of Edinburgh. And the last thing, on 27th of March, for the last two years, I started to celebrate International Day of Multilingualism. I mean, 27th of March is the day mentioned on Rosetta Stone, the famous multilingual document that was in the British Museum. And the hashtag that we are using is multilingual is normal because, as I say, I want to counteract this idea of language, uh, I mean, language learning and multilingual being just something very exotic, new, which came now with globalization and so on and so on. And is, I would say it has been the rule for most of the humanity for most of the last uh, 50,000 years or so. Okay, thank you very much. And as I say, I still hope we have some time for a uh, discussion. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. This was a very interesting, very inspiring talk. Uh, and I guess you made several among us feel that with our professional choice dealing with languages, we are on the right track, aren't we? <laughs> so are there any questions? Okay, so there's a German, uh, a German so, and multilingual. I, I, I just found a lo message. lovely citation here. Sprachliche Mischfalt is besser als sprachliche Monokultur. Uh, language That's diversity, true. so to say, That's mixed true. forest is better, yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one wonderful citation of Goethe, yeah. Uh, this is a, a professor, uh, Professor Samuel Zelimi from Switzerland, who has also got a multilingual language background. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice remark. I see we're talking about a linguistic diet. Uh, so what is the optimal linguistic diet for, for, for you or from your perspective? You said, actually, okay, learn one more language uh, which is close to yours and one which is very different. 
Is it that already, or is the optimal linguistic diet one which comprises even more languages to be learned? Uh, well, I would say, I mean, the metaphor of linguistic diet came from our meeting with, uh, with um, Dina Mehmet Begovic, which we had, in fact, in Brussels. I mean, it was an event organized by the European Commission. And we discovered that we both were using this metaphor for very different reasons. I mean, so she was doing because there was this idea about the healthy food at school and so on. And I was doing it because, of course, there is a big debate about, you know, healthy living dementia and so on and diet. And... Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there are of course some schools which say, oh, you just need you know, blueberries or you just need celery and so on. But the <laughs> real, really good evidence is rather about diversity. It is important to yes, have yes. a diverse food. It's not about one ingredient that you have. Yes, and I, I, therefore, I would say it's about diversity. It's knowing different languages. So in some way, that's I say why I'm so much supportive and I'm very happy that Scotland, unlike England, is still supporting the European mm -hmm. Union policy of one plus two languages. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, two languages is not enough. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I would go, I mean, one definitely not, but I would mm -hmm. say two not. I mean, I would go at least three and then having the, the diversity is what mm -hmm. makes it really important. Actually, that's this aspect of linguistic diet I was talking about, the type and number of languages to be learned. Uh, very nice. Thank you very much for your answer. So two foreign languages, one very close, one very remote from your own mother tongue or our own mother tongues is not enough. That's a very important um, motivational aspect, I guess. May I ask you a personal question? Um, you, you told us about your biography, so you've been learning uh, or working and living in a lot of linguistic contexts. Um, this was immersion. Uh, is there any foreign language which you learned without this aspect of immersion? And um, if so, how could you make it to learn so many languages and to develop them uh, towards a very high level? Uh, well, I would say, I mean, it depends on context. So, I mean, it's difficult to learn uh, to a high level without, without immersion. Uh, I mean, I have on my, on health linguistic diet, I have a kind of uh, short biography, my linguistic biography, where I also mention how I started learning uh, Latin, which is quite interesting because it was, so to say, out of political protest. So mm -hmm. in coming to Poland, the communists didn't like Latin because mm -hmm. that was, of course, not a, you know, Arbeit und Bauernsprache. It was not a workers <laughs> language. Quite way you were learning Latin in order to show the communists that you disagree with them. So mm. uh, you can learn an ancient language out, out of political protest. Uh, that, but, yeah, but, but generally, I, I would say it's always, I mean, for me, it's, it's simply a kind of incredible curiosity how things mm. work in different languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I gave this example of Kaupatori because very often people have, oh, that's a kind of very different language and so on. Mm -hmm. It's always mm -hmm. trying to look what is behind the surface, mm -hmm. which that's why I gave this Kaupatori example because Kaupatori doesn't sound familiar probably to most of us except Finnish speakers, but yet beyond, beyond the surface, there mm -hmm. are things that are incredibly familiar to us. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Oh, there's one hand raised. Okay, um, uh, thank you. So you think that it's <clears throat> natural, right, to learn more than one language, right? Absolutely. I would say our brain is, so to say, practically made to cope with multiple languages, both in childhood, but also later on. And I see multilingualism as a product of linguistic deprivation. It's very nice that you stressed, which many of us may have known beforehand, that monolingualism, so individual monolingualism, is actually the exception and not the rule. And that's what we have to... I, I think we need to, we really need to turn the tables from a discourse, which is kind of very strongly influenced, of course, by UK and US, mm. uh, work, which kind of assumes that the natural form of human brain, mind, and society is monolingualism to one where this is seen as a weird exception, mm -hmm. which it is. And, and I think that's how it is. So I, I think changing the default settings in our approach is really important. And, and I think we should all work on that because in a way, mm -hmm. uh, this, I mean, this, you know, monolingual idea, particularly in Anglo-Saxon world, is very strongly connected with the idea of kind of Anglo-Saxon superiority. Mm 
Mm. It is a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, the, the Emergence of English Native Speaker by, oh, it's, it's an Anglicist from Munich. Um, uh, uh, I, I had it in one of my uh, slides, in fact. Uh, and uh, I, I, I mean, very often the idea was there is this kind of superior language called English, and then you have the kind of hierarchy going down. So you have the combination of a kind of very colonial linguistic imperialist mind shift with the ideology of monolingualism. And I think we should clearly work against that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, in a region like Saarland in Germany, and Reason which region which you know, there are people, of course, who speak French and German, and those who live close to the border very often mix these languages. You talked about language switching, translanguaging, and so on. Uh, but isn't this way of speaking a language like um, starting a sentence in French, then the next word coming to your mind is German, then you continue in French, then some words in German? Isn't this uh, not only chaos, chaos created in the human brain, but also bad for health? for mental health? Uh, well, I, I think, as I say, I don't think that there is something, uh, such thing like a kind of really uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. uh, this you get, by the way, I mean, it's a question which I find, you know, very interesting. And that's why I have this kind of second, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, second uh, survey where we are looking at languages in later life. People don't mix languages unless they get really bad uh, brain diseases. Mm -hmm. And I could see that, by the way, in my own mother. I mean, when she had a I mean, bowel cancer with, with liver metastasis, in okay. her last no. week, she was mixing Polish and German, which she would have mm -hmm. never done. Mm -hmm. She always, she could speak both. She could mix, or let's say she could mix when she could. So for instance, with me, she would mix both languages because she knew that I understood them. Mm -hmm. But when she was speaking to a pure, so to say, Polish only speaker, she mm -hmm. would speak only Polish. If she was speaking mm -hmm. to a German speaker, she would speak only mm -hmm. German. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is that she started speaking, for instance, you know, Polish to Wilhelm, my best friend, mm -hmm. uh, who didn't speak a word of Polish. So mm -hmm. I think that, uh, the, the, I mean, I wouldn't worry about the mixture because already kids learn what they can use with whom. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. I was saying, I was kind of checking with my daughter, when mm -hmm. I was telling her, boli mi głowa, in Polish, I have headache, she mm -hmm. would run to mommy and say, mommy, mommy, daddy has sore head. But mm -hmm. if I said the same in Spanish, me duele la cabeza, Mm -hmm. Then she would not translate because, of course, mommy is Spanish. She knows Spanish. She doesn't need a translation. Mm -hmm. So depending whether I said something in Polish or in Spanish, she would translate it for mommy or not. And that from yes. 84. So I think this idea of confusion is a projection of monolinguals who don't really understand it. Because, as I say, I think it's fine to mix languages in a surrounding where we can do it because we know mm -hmm. that other partners do it, but already kids learn that, you know, you have to adjust your repertoire of language mm -hmm. mixing to mm -hmm. whoever is on the other side. In, in a way, I think there are even new models of bilingualism, Abu Talebi yeah. and Green and so on, mm -hmm. which say that, so to say, the best exercise for the brain is where you have sometimes mixing and sometimes separation, because mm -hmm. then you, mm -hmm. so to say, you need to negotiate different That's language true. modes. That's true. That's true. Indeed. Thank you very much. So this is your applause. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot for the uh, interest. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. See you, see you later. And thanks for your inspiring talk. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.